Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our remote recruitment event. Um, I'm sure I don't need to explain quite why we're doing this. Last year recruitment really, really changed and we just wanted to see if we could help everyone with this. Um, just so you're all aware, there is going to be a recording made of this and it will be available afterwards on our YouTube channel. There is also time at the end for any questions, but if you've got questions during the event, please feel free to put them in the chat section below and, and we will address them at the end. So first of all, I would just like to shamelessly plug our hosts today. Um, we have the lovely Lowry Davies. She is a talent acquisition consultant at Harvey Nash, working the change and commercial markets. We also have Aaron Hamilton. He is a senior recruitment consultant and he does test and dev. And then you have myself. I work similar roles to Lowry for change. So today's event, um, here is the agenda. We've broken it up into four different sections, attracting talent, interview process, onboarding and commitment. And here is our fantastic panel. Um, again, thank you so much guys for joining us today. We have Sarah Harrison, she is the Recruitment Manager at Edrington, Anna Lindsay, Programme Manager at Equator, Chris Hodder, Senior Software Engineer at getaroom.com, Gail Reed is the Team Lead and Scrum Master at Intelligent Growth Solutions, and Harmeet Dilbar is a Recruitment Business Partner at Capco. So, Moving on to our first question. I think we should have everyone's faces appearing soon. Um, so this is all on how you are attracting talent virtually. So as March set in 2020, it was a client led market with candidates on furlough or being made redundant in really hard hit industries. 2021 is proving to be a lot different with the market picking up and candidates having more options as the world starts to open again. Sarah, how have you guys at Edgington been attracting talent? Hi, everyone. Oh, I think I've got some echo. Does that sound okay, Bethany? Yeah, that sounds fine from here, thanks. Great, it was a bit overzealous there. Um, look, it's a huge question. Um, and I think for me, there's, there's probably two parts to this question. Um, one is sort of an internal lens, because um, I think throughout or over the last year, what became very apparent in the market was that individuals and candidates were looking to work for organisations that had um, sort of treated their employees in the right way throughout the pandemic, that had responded well to what was happening in the market, that had managed to sort of pivot um, and, and do the right things throughout that, that period. So I think for, for us, in terms of attracting talent, we sort of started to look internally first to look at how we were managing our own internal talent pools and really what was engaging our employees over that period to then really be able to turn that narrative externally to probably create more of a window into an insight into Edgington as an organisation. So I think, I suppose we would call that our employer brand and how we were conveying our employer brand in the market to ensure we were reaching and attracting the right talent. So we did that, I suppose, in a number of, of ways, if you want to think about virtually or, or sort of digital platforms. Um, but as I say, it was using those sort of internal messages through sort of carrying out engagement surveys and, and doing all the right things and having the right programmes in place um, to then share that, that messaging externally. I think traditionally, Edgington's been quite conservative as an employer and we've all, always let sort of our consumer brands sort of speak for themselves in the market. And I think it was really time for us to sort of shift that dial and to connect with prospective employees. So how do we do that? So we did that in a number of ways. We started using video um, a lot more. And obviously through pandemic and people working remotely, that was quite difficult to do. But we really encouraged sort of hiring managers and leaders when we had roles to sort of video themselves at home, um, really using you know, Zoom or Teams technology or even their mobile phones to really create an insight to who they were, you know, what, what sort of roles we had, why Edgington was an attractive sort of employer to work with um, and really challenge them to, to create sort of videos and um, using tech to then showcase that in the market to really, I think, create sort of a true insight to what it's like to work at Edgington, 
we're very lucky that we have a studio team internally, so a sort of creative digital agency that we're then able to sort of, uh, you know, professionalise that to, to an extent um, to, to share in the market. Um, but I think it was really about sort of creating those connections um, and, and, and especially in an environment where, you know, prospective employees or, or talent weren't going to be able to come into the office to meet people and maybe weren't going to sort of be able to see the environment or, or sort of the, the working culture. It was a really good way to connect and again use our people and really how they felt about working at Edrington to share that message in the market um, through through video. So that was something I think that really worked well for us on our, our sort of website and on our social channels um, to connect and I suppose elevate above a traditional advert or, or a you know accompanying traditional job description. I think as, as part of that as well, um, we could then sort of track the success of things like our videos or our narrative and our, our sort of images to really see if that was engaging with people in the market and what platforms people seem to be engaging with us on um, and really look at the success of those to see if we're reaching sort of the right talent and attracting the right talent to the organisation. So I suppose that's just sort of a, a brief overview of some of the sort of tools or, or the approach that we took and um, really looking inwards before we could look externally. Um, there's then sort of more practical things as well, Bethany, um, in and around, you know, we're all, we've all been working from home, we've all adopted, you know, Teams or Zoom or different technologies to enable us to work remotely. Um, and internally, we started to offer sort of secondment opportunities um, or internal moves sort of around the world. So where we used to be quite location specific, if a role was sort of UK based, retired in the UK, we actually sort of opened up those opportunities um, and found it was really, really successful sort of having global mobility without having the, the geographical move, if that makes sense. So we started to adopt that approach externally as well and started to really advertise our roles remotely and advertise our roles in different geographies to really expand our talent pools and expand our reach, where I think previously we'd been quite specific to, to, to location. And I think for us, that was great. And I think also for potential talent, it was great to be able to access those roles where previously they might not have been able to, to apply. Um, so, so that, that, I suppose that's just, I'm very mindful of time, um, but that's just a couple of things uh, that, that we adopted throughout the past 12 months and certainly looking forward that we'll look to enhance. Really good, really, really interesting as well. I've not heard that from everyone. Um, Gail, did you have some things that you'd like to say? Yeah, I, I think, um, weirdly, our story at IGS is almost the polar opposite of that. Um, we, we, we've been a startup, um, so our, our recruitment process wasn't this elaborate thing before, before um, pa the pandemic hit. My team was five people um, at the point where we started, and now, now we're at just over 20, 21, 22, where, where we've built that out to. And we found that the pandemic didn't really because of the type of business that we're in and, and because the pandemic caused people a lot of concerns around things like food security, suddenly the world became very interested in what we were doing. So IGS, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, are, we're involved in vertical farming and creating, creating vertical farming processes. So suddenly the world tur turn, turned to us and said, right, how can you help? What can we do? So, so there was just generally an, an interest in what we were doing. We obviously Nobody wants to say that their um, their future is brightened by a pandemic, but it certainly didn't help our business model that, that this was what happened. But people were very keen to, to reach into us and find out what was happening there. And we certainly didn't see a, a, a slowdown in our, in our recruitment process. Um, what the things that we had to look at and we're, we're very much concerned with building a culture as, as we, and, you know, startups quite often have that, that um, the luck to be able to try and grow that culture from grassroots and that's we're, we're certainly trying to do that here and um, so we're looking at building the right kind of team we've had the luxury in the pandemic that people um, who are slightly further afield are, are willing to, to reach into us and be willing to do these these um, video chats and, and be willing to really talk to us so our, our what we focused on was building the right story to go into our um, into our recruitment and and go into our, our job specs. And the first section of our entire job spec is about selling what it is that we're looking for in a human being. And that's really a big thing in our recruitment process is, is making sure that we have humans that we want to work with. You know, my my um, my boss will constantly say that you you spend a third of your life sleeping, a third of it working and a third of it playing. So so you better make sure that that, that third that you're working, you're working with people that you enjoy. So that's, you know, that's a, a really key part of what we do. And we look to 
that there have been certain tools that we use, but again, slightly, slightly differently focused. One of the things that we use is, um, what, again, what we would refer to as the cat Matfield test. For those of you who haven't uh, heard of this, this uh, woman and her, and her website, she has a, a portal that you can put your, your job specs into and it will look for subtle gender biases in, in your, your profiles because the science says that if you, if you aim a CV which is gender biased towards men, then women will not apply for that role. But if you create a, a job spec that is subtly gender biased towards women, men will completely ignore that and apply anyway. And, and, but you will also get the benefit that, that women will apply for that too. So we're trying to make sure that we, we get a, a good balance of people through that. And we don't want to be, we, don't, we certainly don't want to be in a position where we are deliberately trying to hire one gender or deliberately trying to hire another gender or any, you know, any of the genders in between but we want to make sure that we are opening it up to as many people as possible and again making sure we're getting that human experience and as for um as for the actual team's experience and, and the interview experience again we focus on on the human i will generally speaking start any interview that i have by saying by warning people a toddler is bound to come in my dog is about to jump up you know i i work generally in my kitchen there will be a lot of noise there will be people coming in and out of this constantly and and let that by, by doing that, letting them know that when those things happen in their at their side, that it's okay, and that it's okay to be human within this this challenging interview space. So I think yeah, it, it's it's very much a, the kind of other side of that story. But but you know, I, I like to think that it's what works for us so far. Yeah, Gail, I, I, I absolutely love hearing what what you're doing. To be honest, I think there's probably quite a lot of synergy. And from what you're saying, because it, it, you know, it is about understanding what's important. For the organisation, but also what's important for individuals, and I think that is absolutely something that's come through in the last twelve months, as we've you know seen into people's homes and you know seen you know as you say the kids running about. Right now, I've got McAllen as my background because I'm in my, my son's playroom, um, and you don't want to see all the Lego and things lying around. But there was it's that word human that's what really stood out to me. But what you just said, there's an absolute human element where people are starting to make decisions based on what's important to them. So, um, so I don't know if I can do this in the right way, but absolutely, we were starting to look when I said inwards, it was thinking about what are our values? You know, how, why do our people want to work here? Sure, it's for different reasons, but, but trying to then convey that externally to yeah, reach, reach the right people or, or the right talent that had so alignment. Good. You know, so just, I just wanted to say that on the human element, I like that, that phrasing because it's so true. And, and at the end of the day, recruitment and talent is a very human process because, you know, it's a very people-led process. So, um, I think there's actually more synergy, although we're completely different organisations yeah. from, what, from what you said. Absolutely. I think even the, the um, we, are, we are very much, um, you were talking about being able to hire people remotely and, and really encouraging that. And we are actually, we're very much a face-to-face -face team because we're running, we're running scrum teams. We want to be face-to-face. -face. We want to have all those water cooler talks. And we're finding that a big challenge at the moment is, is yeah. Um, recruiting people who don't want to work remote and and once the pandemic is over who want to be back in this space with us but we're we're holding out and and you know it's part of our I suppose our character that we're looking for is someone who wants to be in and and work with us but also be in the room when we say right we're done working for today we're going to the arcade and someone who wants to join us in that great thanks guys well um we'll move on to the next question then so We've almost touched on it a little bit, which is lovely. Um, what is your virtual interview process? So with interviews just being a mouse click away, candidates miss out on that interview mindset, stirred by travel to the interview and that invaluable in-person interaction, such as just building rapport on the walk to the interview room. So how, how have you guys in your organisations been dealing with this virtually? And Harmi, I'll let you start. Hi everyone, um, Harmit Dilber, for, um, a resourcing partner for Capco. Um, for anyone that doesn't know who we are, we're a management consultancy focused on the finance sector. Um, it's quite an interesting one because I only started at Capco um, in January there. Um, previously I was with Heineken and then moved across, very, very different interview process. So, um, and, and what Sarah and Gail have touched upon is that human aspect of things because you don't have that, you, you can't see the whites of people's eyes, you know, you can't go into the office at the moment and it's how do you bring that then virtually? So um, at Capco, when I first joined, I was told, okay, it's a four-stage interview process and I was like, four stages through the process, our candidate's going to be engaged through it sort of all. 
And I have to admit, I think it's one of the best places that I have been and that I have actually then adapted and we've looked at this four-stage process. And um, I think Bethany will, will maybe agree as well that a lot of the candidates that we're getting through said it's probably one of the best processes they've been through because we make sure that people are meeting four different people from the, the entire organization. So our process is, it's half an hour with myself, right? you know, very sort of high level HR. And it's that, like you said, that human interaction in terms of, this is just a chat. It's not a competency-based um, interview. And this is, um, it's just about them. It's biographical. It's about their CV. It's about what they do and what they are wanting from, from their future career. And then once, um, and the first stage after they meet me is, a uh, one hour sort of interview or conversation with our principal consultant. So it's a deep technical dive into their CV, but again, it's all biographical. So there's none of the describe a situation where that happened or describe a situation where this happened. It's all about, tell me about yourself. Tell me about the projects. It's all business change and consulting we do. So, you know, project managers, business analysts, et cetera. So it's a bit more of a technical dive into their CV, but it also gives the candidate a chance to ask the principal consultant, what does it actually mean to be a consultant with Capco? You know, in terms of the potential business development, sales, or the delivery sort of piece of um, of the role. So again, it's an hour, and again, it's just a conversation. And I've, I've uh, instructed the principal consultants, again, don't go too hard, just understand what they're looking for and what their technical aspect is. Um, and then if that goes well, the next stage is a case study. So again, it's 12, 20 minutes. They get pre presented with a scenario and it's again on delivery. It's what sort of challenges will you come across? What does your first week look like? What does your third week look like? So, and again, again, it's, a, it's an hour. It's a presenting back of a case study. And again, it's just all about the candidate and their delivery and what they do. And then the last stage is again, it's a conversation with one of our partners. So they've met myself as HR, They've met um, a couple of the principal consultants all at different levels. They see a diverse sort of um, scope of, of, of people working at Capco. And then the partners as well. The partners, again, they're lovely. It's a conversation. Um, so what they do is they, they take probably repeating um, from that sort of first stage in terms of what does a person want to do. But because the partners have got more of an overview of the business and where we are and where we're going, it's very fruitful from the candidate's point of view. So by the end of it, the candidate has everything they need from Capco's point of view, and we've got everything we need from um, the candidate's point of view. And I think that's quite a good way of doing things, especially virtually. I, I mean, I've, in the last sort of four or five months, I've recruited in excess of about 80 people. Again, it's business change and consulting. It, and everyone has said it's a great process. And I think it's because they have met so many different characters within sort of Capco. And it gives them that sort of illusion of going into the office and having those sort of chats and, um, you know, meeting, um, you know, people um, from that point of view. So, again, that is Capco's process, um, which I don't know. I, when I first came, I thought maybe it's overkill, you know, because if you look at the, the opposite of when they used to do that, when people were going into the office, people would have to take half days off. Um, you know, they would have to maybe take a day off to do the interview. Um but now, because it's virtual, people can click a mouse, go through that interview process, relax, and go through it. And, and I, th I think our acceptance rate is about, I think it's like 92% or something like that as well, which you're always going to get a few people that don't accept. But yeah, so that's uh, that's a very general gist of, of Capco's process. I don't know um, you know, what to, like Gail and Sarah sort of think. Yeah, I, I can, I'm happy to come in on that. I, I, I agree with a lot of the, the, the points that you're saying very much. We go through a, a three-stage process. We have um, myself and the, the head of software engineering do that, that initial um, that initial half-hour chat. Same as you, there, there are, we don't have set questions. We tell them, in, in fact, in that, that a lot of the, the point in that first interview is for them to get to know us as much as it is for them for us to get to know them. Um, thankfully, my, um, my head of engineering and I have a, a really good... Um, to be honest, bantery relationship. So, so we're we're always bouncing bouncing off each other and having a laugh and a joke with each other and slightly making fun of each other. If I'm honest, yeah. And and we find that that helps the the, the candidates to relax a little bit. And um, and when we're we we talk about what we do as a company and and thankfully everyone's always a little bit evangelical when they when they talk about our company. So there's always a big a high energy at that point. And then we take a walk through their CV, but we we let them direct us in that because everyone has parts of their CV that kind of don't want you to ask about so rather than lead them into that we, yeah. we will say to them can, can, if, if 
you know, what would you point out from from your CV that is either something that you're really proud of, something that you think might be relevant to what we do, or even something that really frustrated you that you'd like to talk about a different way that you would do that, and just something that lets us see, just lets us see them light up with with information. And that's yeah. and we tell them that that's what we're looking for from them. We also use that as our first step to warn them about how how our team's social interactions work and how they're going to have to be willing to be part of the joke system that we always have and and the back and forth that we have you know we'll, we'll warn them that if our if our lead SRE hasn't made a meme of you within the first month then then you know you're probably not fitting in quite yet because it's just something that you have to be used to in our team that it's got to be a fun place to work so that's mm -hmm. our, our you know that half our first stage is always quite a fun conversation our, yeah. our second stage is just that quick technical test that they can do at home nothing nothing that's particularly challenging in it but we do warn them when they're doing that technical test that the the final stage is a meeting with a much bigger selection of the team and we will tell them that there's always one of our senior developers who likes to come in and and I will quote this verbatim, we describe him as the panto villain because he comes in and he will ask the hard questions about your technical test and he'll he'll walk you through it step by step and he will ask you all of those um all of the difficult questions about inheritance and, and the differences between you know C and C sharp and all those sorts of things because he thoroughly enjoys asking them. But we let them know it in a fun way to know that you know it's not going to be the end of the world, their answers regardless on it. Because a big part of our hiring process is is hire for fit and train for skills. As long as you have the basic yeah. skills to do it, if we like you, we will hire you because we know we can we can get together as a, as a family and, and get you to the level we need you to be at. So that's, that's our, our three stages are, are very much a, do we, do we like you is most important then, can you do the job? If you get yeah. competent with the job, then we see if the rest of the team think they can work with you because that's what matters does. No, 100%. I think that's important as well from that initial conversation um, is that fit from even from both sides as well. Because, I mean, like I've only been with Capco now since sort of January time and I haven't met a single soul. You know, I've not been into the office yet. I've recruited so many people. You know, it's understanding that sort of culture and passion. And people are saying, how do you know what it's like? Because you've never met anyone. Well, it's because for each of the interviews, they've got such a wide selection of people they're meeting via the interview and I, I, I pretty much done the same um, and then it's the interactions that I have with actually the senior leadership team you know when we're talking about sort of strategies and the way they come across um, work is great if you don't take it too seriously you know and, and we're we're a management consultancy we're dictated to by our clients and it can be stressful and, and there's been that sort of situation but I think from the interview point of view you've just got to make them realize that it is a fun place to work. Um, yes, it will be stressful, but you'll also have really good um, a, a good time. Um, but also the websites, I think, really important as well. And coming back to that sort of attracting, if you look at our website, you know, we talk about our culture, our values, be yourself at work. And that's what actually in, in, um, I was intrigued about Capco, because when you look at consultancies, you know, it's not the... The general, if you're looking at some of the sort of maybe the big four um, and, and the way sort of Capco sort of values and culture are and, and all the sort of extracurricular stuff that we do, that's what we talk about in our in our interview process in terms of, you know, when you get in reviewed, you talk about our core, you talk about your community and your delivery. So it's it's all the fun stuff as well as just the delivery part as well. And I think that's what people are, in, are engaged in. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I think, I don't think I would have recruited the numbers I've recruited if it hadn't been for this virtual, because I think that if we were back in normal terms, um, then people do have to take times out of their office and their diaries and stuff like that as well. So I think it's actually been beneficial from, from Capco's, 100% from Capco's point of view. Yeah, I, I agree, Harvey. I think that I, I'm not looking forward to trying to schedule diaries and meeting rooms yeah. when, when we get back. I, I'll mirror what both Gail and Harvey have said in terms of, um, well, certainly diversity of panel or diversity of people that, that um, uh, interviewees are, are meeting to try and build uh, you know, an understanding of not just the, the, the people within your immediate team, but, but people across the organisation. So we've got a very collaborative culture and, and most roles will connect with people across business unit, cross function, across the globe a lot of the time. So we are, we, we've really put a lot of thought into diversity of our panels. Um, we've also done really small changes, like trying to actually have 45 minute interviews as opposed to one hour interviews, just be mindful of, you know, being on yeah. screen. For, for a period of time, so even if it's adding a step into the process, um, you know, it's, it's just, you know, and I think it could be quite 
quite quite strain, straining, especially when you're in a job that you're in teams meetings or whatever all day to then have yeah. this full, full hour. So we've sort of shortened the times, but still try to incorporate the coffee chat as one of the stages as well yeah. um, with a peer in the team. So giving a, you know um, interviewees an, an opportunity to sort of ask them questions about, look, what's it really like in the team? And perhaps even talk about more things like our wellbeing programme or are giving more days. So we're owned by a charitable trust, um, the Robertson Trust, and it's a big part of our culture that we that everyone has four days, you know, to 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 spend on charitable activities and things like that. So it's really trying to share more about the culture and that kind of coffee chat and the environment to say, look, this is what we're about as an organization. Because you know, you've got the job description, you've got the technical interview, and, and that that's all about the role, but actually more broadly, why would you want to work here? So we're trying to do all of that. One of the things that's slightly different that we've introduced. Um, recently, and it's been a bit of a learn, is actually using video interviewing as well. Um, now, I don't know if this landed really well at the beginning because it felt a little bit cold. And again, because we had a collaborative culture and we're really, you know, we're really focused on people, um, I, I felt there was a wee bit of a disconnect at first. But what we've done, we've really developed it um, as a first stage interview so that we are using the video as a platform to share more about the organization, the team, the people in the team, and provide color to a job description for, for, for applicants. But at the same time, just finding out a bit more about them over a sort of, you know, four or five questions basis, almost like a pre, you know, sort of pre-interview um, to just find out a bit more about them as an individual. Um, what that has done is meant we can interview 10 people at first stage instead of maybe having to shortlist further you know, for, for five people coming in for an hour interview. So we actually get to meet more people through that process. Um, and at the same time, as I say, hopefully it gives applicants more of an insight into the organisation over and above the job description before they come for a formal interview as well. So I definitely will say it's a learn because it's a new technology. And again, it's all, you know, there's, a, there's an argument about the people element of the process, but, but we're trying to just really use it as an engagement tool. Um, and it's, it's, it seems to be working very well for certain certain opportunities. So that's something... It's just con constantly under review um, as well. Mm. That sounds cool. That's I'm going to just come in. I noticed the, the, the question that came in, in the, on the, the Q&A there about whether, whether liking people stops that diversity happening um, within, within your interviewing process. Um, I will say that when, when we talk to people, we do talk to them about the fact that what we are, we are not looking for clones of the same people. We are looking for what my, my boss refers to as, as diversity of thought within our team. And I think when you're hiring in the space for software engineers, there's an awful lot. Uh, and I speak, I, I say this as my, from my place as a, 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 you know, a software engineer for 12 years, we are generally quite an, a, neuro, a neuro atypical group anyway. So you're always looking for those, you're always connecting with those unusual personalities and you're always trying to get a team where you can balance out um, you know, I've, I've had conversations where I've thought this is this personality is quite large. And if I have that personality in my team, will some of my quieter members still engage in, in my conversations and in my meetings? And I've had I've had interviews where um, we've, we've got off the, the call and, and had, a, you know, I had a quick catch up after it. And, and my boss has said his personality is going to frustrate the hell out of me. But some of my best relationships have been with people who've challenged me like that. So I think we should give them the tech test and I think we should we should still consider this. So it's, it's definitely an interesting balance and it's something that you have to think about, but you're trying to, I don't want a, a, a team of clones because it just doesn't work. You, you don't want a team who are always going to agree. You want people who are going to be able to challenge each other. And you do have to have people in your team who are willing to speak out, but you, you definitely don't want everybody to be the same. Yeah. Yeah, you do want a diverse team is the best team. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the next topic. So assuming the interview's gone well, the candidate has got the job or you, the candidate, has accepted, it's then in that tricky onboarding phase. So that can be quite a treacherous time between being offered and accepting and then when you actually begin, um, that's when the things in the neck which is like counter offers <laughs> and all these other things that can come in the way um, and we've certainly noticed with everything going on right now that area is a bit more of a challenge than it was before um, what have you guys been doing to tackle this and, and we'll start with with you Chris if that's okay Hi, yeah. Um, I'm uh, Chris Hodder. I'm senior software engineer at Get a Room, and we're basically a hotel availability broker um, is the easy way to understand what we do um, and uh, I think that in that uh, sort of onboarding phase, 
before they start, it's really important to keep the comms channels open, especially when we're all so remote from one another. Um, I think, and, and that initial um, sort of meeting is a little bit more tenuous than when you've met someone in person. And I think that that's something that uh, Sarah and, and Gail have talked about is trying to sort of build up that connection um, in a more strong way when it would have come more naturally if we'd just met in the flesh. If we'd met in person in the office, it would have we would have had a much stronger connection than we get through this kind of medium. Um, and I think that does make it just that little bit more fraught. Um, I actually changed roles recently myself and there was quite a lot of delay in getting the contract to me. And I started to worry, I've, I've put in my notice already. I, am I gonna get this contract? I've not met these people in person. And it was very stressful actually. Um, and I ended up kind of chasing my, my new manager again and again and again, where, where, when's my contract coming through? So I think that, um, you know, I, I have not yet been recruiting in this role, but I will be. And I think that uh, what I have learned from my, my previous role where I, where I did a lot of recruiting was you need to keep those comms channels open. You need to be very on top of getting back to the candidate and saying, there's been a little bit of a delay, but don't worry, I, I haven't forgotten about you. You haven't sort of disappeared in my inbox. Um, you know, I'm expecting to get this for you um, sort of uh, you know, by next week or whenever, just manage their expectations as much as possible. I think that's kind of the the big thing that that I I have learned from as both a candidate and a hiring manager. Um, and post start, I think it's still very very um, uh, tenuous and, and very it's very fraught uh, because um, people aren't you know, again, they're not meeting people in the same way that they would have if we were all in the office, we're all together. Um, and they don't feel as comfortable talking to other members of the team. And this is something that I saw a lot in my in my previous role is that it was a real challenge getting people to say, you know, I started, but I don't know what I'm doing. I've started, but I, I need to find this thing and I don't know where it is. And can you please help me? Um, because they felt like when they were reaching out, they were bothering somebody in a way that they didn't feel if if you know we were in an office and they just had to wheel their chair over to me and say you know can you please tell me what i should be doing or how i can get this they felt that when it was a teams notification or a slack notification or an email coming in they felt that that was somehow more invasive and more like you know it was making a nuisance of themselves um and so you know, there's, there's a lot of work needs to go into um, making them comfortable in the new team and, uh, you know, helping them communicate with other people. I don't want to sort of spill into the next topic of commitment too much, but I think there's a, you know, we've had to do a lot of work there um, of, of just making people comfortable and, and feel empowered to speak out and to ask for help. And that, you know, make them feel that they're not bothering me by painting me and asking me what they should be doing. You know, um, I would rather they did that than sit and wait till the next stand up. Um, and in fact, that that's a very much a losing kind of path there where they, they end up waiting to the next stand up to, to speak up. And then people think, what well, what were they doing? You know, with that whole time. So um, I think that's, that that's, you know, Communication is probably how I would best sum it up um, and really working on that. I think um, you can probably build on that as well. So I've recently been a candidate and um, left and then moved to my current role. So I'm Anna Lindsay. I'm the programme manager at Equator. We're a digital transformation agency and I've kind of gone from being candidate to hiring manager for, for roles in our team Um in my, my previous um, experience of, of joining a company during lockdown, um, that onboarding, um, that eight weeks of onboarding is really where you're getting your initial flavour for what that company says they were in the interview. So in the interview, we've been told we're going to do things differently. We're hiring you because you can bring something different. We're going to be more innovative. These are all the things we're going to do. And then your onboarding experience happens and it's kind of where everything stops. So... Um, there was an issue with getting an employment reference. That was instantly my problem, which Harvey Nash ended up um, sorting for me. Um, and that's the kind of early warning sign that you're like, oh, maybe 
maybe not, but you give them the benefit of the doubt and, and you keep going. Um, obviously, in a lockdown situation, we're, we're working from home. I, I think at that point that I joined that company, I think it was maybe October time. So it wasn't necessarily new. The, 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 the recruitment had been ongoing for them, um, but they hadn't quite um, adapted to our, to our new normal. So um, they didn't have a remote onboarding experience. Um, so I had to go into to, had to go into the office, um, a kind of clunky startup, um, and I'm at home with a laptop that didn't work. Um, and then I was back the next day to, to then um, fulfil that that onboarding. Um, and that kind of sets the scene before you've even started to say this company's values are not quite what have been pitched to me and oh no, <laughs> what have I done? And if you get that wrong in that year, Uh, have we lost her? I think we may have lost Anna. Two more seconds. It was always going to happen to one of us. Uh, and it was me. It was <laughs> oh, me. you're back. Yeah. You're back. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can't tell who's frozen. Is it only Anna we've lost? It might be me now. Right, we've got but, that. Yeah, so I was just saying basically that yeah, it makes you really think about what you want to get from a company and, and their values. And I think now doing a lot of recruitment for Equator and into our, our project management team, um, it's really about making sure that candidate doesn't feel like they're forgotten before they get to us. It's probably made you even better at that, Anna. Because <laughs> like like, yeah, like all the <laughs> Absolutely. And and I make sure that people hear from me before they start. Yeah, it's a lovely touch. You're frozen again a bit, but I know you've got stuff to talk about on commitment too. So <laughs> um, we're almost kind of sliding into the next section anyway. So we wanted to do an entire topic on commitment just as a whole um, with the whole kind of digital disconnect that we've got going on right now. Um, commitment throughout the process has definitely been more of a challenge to keep. Um, so what have you guys been doing to, to, to help encourage that and, and, and enforce that almost? Well, enforce is the wrong word, but um, I think we've lost Anna. So Chris, would you be able to pick up from there? Yeah, I, I took this topic to be quite broad and, and covering um, both that you know, getting the person on board and then keeping them on board after that and, and integrating them into the team. Um, so I, I hope I'm covering the right stuff here. But um, yeah, as, as I was saying, I kind of slid slightly onto this topic. Um, I have seen lower levels of, of commitment. Um, I've seen um, that at times uh, people have dropped out of the interview process with very, very little warning or just not even shown up to an, an interview that, you know, they had booked. Um, and I think uh, without, you know, repeating myself too often, there has to be quite a bit of communication there and making sure that, you know, uh, we're, we are talking to them frequently during the process and, and keeping them up to date on what is going on. And then after that, when people are on board, I've seen problems in, in, in getting them feeling that they're part of something when they haven't, you know, they haven't sat in the office, they haven't sort of, um, you know, met everyone. And I think that has been a challenge as well. Um, what I found has helped quite a lot is we did a kind of buddy system. So I assigned an, an engineer who was the kind of the onboarding buddy for um, a new candidate. And um, the the idea of this, and it was it was made clear to both the the the, you know, the new hire and the buddy that that it is the buddy's priority to help you, and to to kind of you know sit on a call and get to know you a bit and and um, kind of help you integrate into the team and be there to answer the questions. So it's not you know you're not sort of invading their time to go and ask them for help. Um, Oh, we've got Anna back with a bright new background. I know. Welcome to my dining room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I can probably I heard some of what you were saying as I was frantically moving room. Um, 
again from from a candidate experience um, in the last place that I joined. Um, like you need to be more than just a bum in the seat and a, and a tick box in a recruitment exercise. Um, so what are we going to do to demonstrate that? So when I joined place before I am, um, I didn't meet my boss for four weeks. Um, I had no interaction. Um, I got buddied up with a contractor who wasn't necessarily aligned to making sure I was up to speed. Um, and then there was no kind of team introduction. So my introduction to the team was frantically searching through the org chart to figure out who, who's in my team because your interaction is just the, the four people you see every day on, on Teams or, or Zoom. Um, and it's really important to, to get that right. So from a recruitment point at Equator, um, it's, for me, it's very much about um, how you feel in that role in the first couple of weeks. How are you settling in? Are you meeting people? Are you speaking with people? Um, and the commitment to that onboarder is my responsibility as a line manager, but also our team. So I meet with them, I get them on board, I talk to them before they start. Um, I have a 10 minute catch up with them every day to make sure that they have seen someone. Um, and then I might, I might just come in there while while while, while, while Anna's poor Anna. Honestly, does she's she's running about running about trying to get attention. I was just gonna say one of the things I think is really important both for um the recruitment process but also the onboarding um, process, which is very much off the back of what Anna's just explained, is is sort of surveying. Um, so that's one thing that we've introduced in the last year, as well as trying to improve our practices and our processes and think about experience um, of people that are interviewing with us or starting with us. Um, we, 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 we now survey everyone that interviews with Edgington and we survey everyone after the first 90 days in the business. Um, I mean, okay, if, granted that might be too late by the time you're 90 days in, but, but what we're trying to do is build that picture and get an honest view as to how we're managing it and what we can do to improve. Because you can try all the, you know, you can you can try and improve your processes from your perspective. But again, from both what, what Christopher actually and Anna both said, it's about your personal experience and what's important to you. So, um, you know, surveys don't need to be really long. They don't need to be really, you know, in depth. It's just giving people a platform to say, look, this works really well for me or this didn't. Your interview process was great here, but I didn't like the fact I had to present and I couldn't see anyone while I was presenting because it was on Teams and I found it really, you know, really nerve wracking. So again, for me, surveys have been key, even though you don't want to see the feedback sometimes if you think you're doing great and then the comments are, actually, I didn't enjoy that for this reason. Um, you know, you need to know, you need to know that. That's the only way you can improve moving ahead. So yeah. sorry, just off the back of what Chris and Anna both said there, I think surveys are a great way to to find out how you're actually tracking against expectations. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep my camera off and hopefully that will help connection. But um, every time we've had a new start, we've asked them to feed into the next candidate that we've had join um, so that they, we're building on the, the experience of the last person um, and any challenges we've tried to proactively address. Um, starting a new job in lockdown um, and remotely it isn't for everybody's character and we're not going to be able to get it right for absolutely everybody because it, it, it is different um, but we've definitely adapted what we do as as each person has come in the door um, we, we have had people come and, and leave relatively quickly um, but could be challenges of the role as well And we lost Anna again. We lost Anna again. Okay. I can come in a little bit there just to say that <laughs> I think we've realised that we haven't always been the, the best at it as, as we've we've come on to the point where we've actually asked um, some of our, our most recent recruits to, if they would help us to create that onboarding process because the people who are trying to create it at the moment have never come on board during the during this situation. So that's as similar to what Sarah was saying, just making sure that we check in with them and let let the people who are experiencing it feedback how they would like it to happen is working for us at the moment. And has there been any feedback that they've given that surprised you or have they come up with any really good ideas? A lot of it is is very much um, around that space of just not being able to have, as, as, as Christopher was saying earlier on, it, we. 
some of the easiest points is when you start to interrupt somebody is when they've gone to make a coffee and they're walking back to their desk or they've gone to use the loo and they're walking back to their desk and you don't feel as bad interrupting their workflow because you know it's already interrupted. So one of the things that we've been using was for a while was Discord, the, the kind of gamers chat to always keep an open chat, with the audio chat going on in the room so that it felt like even though we weren't in the same room, we could hear each other clicking away on, on keyboards and, and that way it was easy enough just to shout out, can could, could somebody help me with this? Can I sh sh screen share with someone? And another voice in the room would help you do that. So so those things have been quite interesting. But then, yeah, there, there, there was definitely some negatives that came back from it as well that we went, actually, we do have to change this. We're going to, people are feeling are feeling like they can't interrupt if they don't have that audio. That's a brilliant idea. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought of something like that. Because you do feel bad, don't you? Being like, <laughs> sorry, me again. <laughs> yeah. I just say as well, I think that although it's been challenging for everyone, I think there's some real opportunities that have come from 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 working remotely in terms of access to people. So you know, we've been doing sort of a ten minutes with. Um, with our, you know, exec team and senior leaders, and sort of sharing those those interviews globally. You know, how are they hand, you know, how have they found things, and what are their challenges? And 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 I think there's been a lot more access. So we actually set up a global digital induction quarterly with the chief executive and the global HR director, and every new starter globally in that quarter gets an hour and a half with the chief exec and the HR director. And a whole, you know, the, the whole host of things about our strategy and our approach. And, you know, that wouldn't have happened before. You know, you wouldn't get time with Scott McCroskey because, you know, you just wouldn't have had the capability and you wouldn't have got face time if you're in a different country in a different region. So even though there's been parts where it have been really challenging for new employees and, you know, I think there's really great things like that to go, you know, a month in, you're going to have an hour and a half open forum with the chief executive and global HR director to ask them anything and to hear from them. And then the last one we held a couple of weeks ago, you know, Scott was actually talking about our new vision and strategy that he hadn't launched yet. I think he was launched it in the, like that week to, you know, to, to everyone globally. So the, the, you know, the new starters are getting this complete, fresh, new vision of Edgington, you know, from, from, from straight from the chief exec. And so, so, you know, although there's challenges, I think there's some great things that have come as well in terms of accessibility um, and reach to, to people in the organisation. So I think we've also got to look at those positives and go, wow, that's great. Um, you know that you get you get the opportunity to do that through this adoption of technology and you know and trying to engage people um, that might not we might not we just wouldn't have done that a year and a half ago you know it wouldn't have you know it wouldn't have um, it wouldn't have been possible so um, I think it's also good to, to focus on the, the positives like that yeah that's a brilliant positive that is great it, it also kind of takes away the hierarchy as well isn't it like if you're speaking to someone super senior um, someone was saying to me the other week but I can see they've got the messiest kitchen behind them and I loved it. <laughs> Such a good point. Um, guys, these have been great, but we, I'm, I know we've got lots of questions. So I'm going to let Lowry take over from here with some questions from, um, from our attendees. Hi everyone, so thank you so much for some of your points. We've got some good questions as well. Um, one that has been answered in the chat, just in case anyone was wondering, um, was the tool that Gail had mentioned in terms of um, gender bias. Um, if you slide along to the Q&A and go to the answers part, Gail has kindly put the link in there uh, for gender decoder at Matfield, if you want to have a look at that. Um, so yes, yeah, so leading on from sort of the onboarding part of thing, uh, part of things. So we've got how do you help new starters feel part of the team and get to know people when they start from home? Um, part of that was covered, but have you got anything extracurricular? This person's raised that it's difficult not having the people around you, like you said, to sort of invite for lunch on your first day. So as a team, have you guys been doing more? To, to do that as well? I, I would say one of the tools that we've been using is um, since, since the pandemic started, since we all went remote, we have something called the working from home review that we do once a week, which is pretty much a group therapy session where we, we go around the room and we give each other, we give ourselves a, a, a score out of 10 for how we're feeling, not just about how we're feeling about work, how we're sleeping, how home life is, are we losing our minds, what have been the latest um, what have been the latest things that have come down from the Scottish government? What are the, what are the new restrictions? Um, and when once that finishes up, we for the rest of the, the hour, we go into what box sets have we been watching? What games have we been playing? What books have we been reading? And, 
you know, everybody has to have their camera on for that meeting. And it's it's that little bit that forces you to slightly expose uh, a little bit of your life and, and talk a little bit. And you see everybody else doing it. So once you've seen the rest of the team doing it, that becomes easier to do. But that's that's not specific to onboarding, but it's something that, that we're doing is that regular check-in. But also we have on, an onboarding buddy system as well for that, that does a twice weekly check-in with them anyway, uh, over and above their manager doing that. I guess it's touched on that sort of human side of things as well and getting to know people, which we talked about earlier. Um, anything for yourselves that you found useful in getting to know the rest of the team? I guess I could come in slightly on that of um, having joined uh, Get A Room recently. Um, I've joined a very small team and um, uh, sort of there's actually two developers and the uh, the manager and so me and the other the other developer, um, once he's online, because he's actually based in the US, we'll just sit on a call the whole afternoon. And it doesn't matter if we're working on the same thing or different things. We just have a call open, um, very similar to how uh, Gail was saying about having Discord open. Um, and I think that won't always work for people, but it does lead to those little water cooler moments of, you know, my colleague gets online and I say good morning and he says good afternoon. And then we, I sort of ask him how he's doing and we have a bit of, a bit of just a chat, you know, just informal, how's everything going um, before, as he's starting his day. Um, and I think that really helps make it feel like we're colleagues and it would have been a much harder, you know, thing to come into this, you know this very small team um where my colleagues are all in the us um at the moment um and not have that communications channel and not not be able to kind of just sit and talk to them and and just you know sometimes we'll one of us will just pipe up and be like oh you know this unit testing this is doing my head in kind of thing and we'll we'll you know we'll just kind of have that little bit of back and forth about what we're doing and and give each other advice and, and that and i think that really helps and probably wouldn't help work so much or maybe it does work in in gail's team in a, in a larger team um but i can imagine when using a buddy system for example that having a smaller group would help for a lot of people who wouldn't feel comfortable on a chat with like 10 people in it saying uh, I'm stuck with this, you know, because um, that can be quite a big deal, I think, to to admit that you're stuck with something in front of a big group of people. Um, but I've I've certainly found it helpful to have just a call open, you know, with no agenda, no particular purpose to it, and we'll just talk to one another. Nice, lovely. Um, we've got another question here, and obviously we've all been working from home, but how have you been handling people wanting to stay flexible or remote working moving forward? Um, have you seen a change in this? Are people sort of rearing to go back to the office or are people looking for, for that sort of balance? We, we've definitely seen a change in the market. Sorry, I'll let you go on. Yeah, so at a crater, it's definitely going to change the way we work. We used to be five days in the office, nine to half five. Um, and because we've been able to demonstrate that this can work, especially when we're client focused and client facing, um, that we can we can make that work. And we're going to go to a bit of a hybrid model. Um, but there are some people in our team who thrive better and will work better in, in that office environment. And it's just getting the, the balance right for for everyone, but we are definitely looking at how we make that work so that our place is a place that people want to come to and want to work in, and we can put things in place for, for people um, to give them that degree of flexibility while balancing our clients because it's our clients that keep us going. Yeah, I would agree with a lot of that. Um, we, we've always, pre-pandemic, pre we were a team that's, as I, as I said earlier, we'll, we'll drop everything and say, right, it's been a really stressful week. We're going to take a half day today. We're going to go play pool. We're going to go and go to the bowling. We're going to do something like that. We're going to do something fun. I'm, I'm looking to arrange events out now as our team's starting to come back together. And we would love for that still to be the case, that we are an on-site face-to-face team that want to be together. We've always had the rule where if there's a something, some reason where you need to work from home, like, you know, your boiler engineer coming, any of those sorts of things that you absolutely can, but we want that to be, to be not mandated days. And, and we have definitely seen that that has put people off from coming to us. Um, but we're, 
at the moment we're sticking to our guns on it that we want people who want to be back in that office and perhaps that's one way of screening out personalities that don't quite fit in with us and that aren't going to be as social and as and as, as warm into our team and want to integrate with our team but at the moment and by no means is that set in stone that's what we're we're, we're still sticking to our guns and trying to encourage people to do that yeah you know, i find this really interesting because i think the general consensus is people want like people think everyone wants to be at home and um, whereas actually there's a lot of people I speak to that, that in fact there's someone the other day that I spoke to that said before I come in for an interview I just want to check are you going to be back in the office because I, I'm a people person I want to be around people I want to come into the office um, it's been you know great being at home but, but actually I'd rather be majority in the office full time in the office whereas I think most of us expect that everyone wants the opposite because that's been the new thing and uh, we, we, we are pitching 50-50 um, towards the end of the year when you can go back in we are a very collaborative culture we would like you know, to, to for pe you know for people to be in the office fifty percent of the time or thereabouts. But I think we've got to be mindful. There's some people that want to work hundred percent remotely, and then and then there's others that can't because of the nature of their roles at Edgington. So if they work in you know distillation or if they you know they work in global supply chain, you know that you know they they they've worked throughout. So there's people that will be in probably hundred percent of the time. So it's it's probably for me it's about striking a balance, but it's also ensuring we can be you know we can we can attract a broad talent pool because we don't you know we don't want to mandate so much that we're we're missing out on on great people. People. Um, but but I just think it's a really interesting topic because I don't think it's as clear cut as oh, well everyone wants to be at home now because that's the way it's been because there are people that can't wait to get back in the office I'm probably one of them 50-50 it's been lovely being with my children but I actually quite enjoy you know uh, having my own time as well away from away from the house so um, I think that's something that will continue to evolve over time um, and, and, and it will just naturally settle somewhere you know that 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 works for everyone, but it, it's you know well, it's one extreme, and now we're starting to move back to okay, what what's actually going to work moving ahead? Um, so I just think that'll be quite fluid uh, moving ahead. I can't wait to be back in. I hate working from home. <laughs> um, well, listen, everyone, thank you so much. Um, Harmeet had to nip out. By the way, he sends his apologies. I I did know in advance that that would happen. Um, but thank you so much to our panelists. You've, You've all been great. We've actually got way more questions, but this is everyone's lunch hour, so we won't go into that, but we will get them across to the panel, if that's okay with you guys, and we'll get them back. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, this has been recorded and a link will be sent out. Feel free to share it, hopefully. like This has been great. It's been lots of really good ideas, and also hearing what's not worked can be really valuable as well. Um, so yeah, listen, thank you so much, everyone. And um, there'll be our contact details in the email too. So if Harvey Nash can help you in any way as well. Um, and yeah, thanks so much. We've, everyone's got three minutes of their time. So. <laughs> um, but stay safe, everyone. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.